who there we go. Who Jennifer already introduced is Carrie Franklin. The only thing I'll say is Jennifer put the pressure on a little bit for Carrie to come to UCLA. There's 207 of you. I encourage all of you to join us. Uh, <laughs> I to make Carrie uh, welcome. Uh, she's, uh, she's brilliant. Uh, and I'll let her take it from here. Carrie. Thanks so much, Brad and Jennifer and, and everyone who's involved in this panel. I'm really grateful to be here and I'm glad it's happening. So my job here is to talk a little bit about the decision in Vostok and then some of the limitations that the court suggested it might put on that decision. So I'm afraid that means I'm gonna start out on a high note and then descend into an account of all the hard work that still needs to be done. And given that that's the trajectory of my talk, I just wanted to take a moment at the beginning to acknowledge the truly stunning achievement that this decision represents. As Brad noted, before this decision, it was perfectly legal in a majority of states to fire someone on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Texas was one of those states. And on the day this decision came down, I received literally dozens of emails from current and former students. And it was amazing to me how similar they were. And what I kept hearing was, I was reading the opinion and I was shaking and I was feeling that a physical weight was being lifted from me. And I didn't even realize the stress I was carrying every day, knowing that I had worked so hard to go to law school and to build a legal career and one wrong partner or one wrong client and it could all be gone. And the feeling of relief just was a physical feeling. And that made me think of all the people who worked so hard to make this possible who didn't get to experience this day. And I just wanna say the names of Bayard Rustin and Frank Kameny and Harvey Milk and Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin and Sylvia Rivera and Martha P. Johnson and all of these folks, not to mention Donald Zarda and Amy Stevens, who worked so hard and sacrificed so much, and all of the other people whose names I didn't mention, who gave so much to see this day uh, and make this country a better and fairer place. And this decision couldn't happen without them. So what did happen? Well, the court in a 6-3 decision by Justice Gorsuch interpreted Title VII using a methodology called textualism. And textualism says, we're not going to look at what the legislators intended and what was in their minds when they passed the statute. We're going to look just at the words they wrote. And the words they wrote were the government, uh, sorry, discrimination on the basis of sex violates the law. It is illegal to discriminate on the basis of sex. So even though it was unlikely that legislators in 1964 thought that they were protecting LGBT individuals when they passed this law, the words that they wrote do protect people on these bases, be, or sorry, do protect people because they prohibit sex discrimination. And the court says anytime you discriminate against people because they are gay, lesbian, or transgender, you are in part discriminating against them on the basis of their sex. Court cites a number, uh, uses a number of examples to illustrate this point, right? It says if uh, an employer fires Jamal for having a boyfriend, but allows Angela to have a boyfriend, that is simply discriminating on the basis of sex, tolerating in the woman what you're not tolerating in the man. Likewise, imagine we have an employee who identifies a female, uses female pronouns, wears women's clothing. Those actions are fine if the person was labeled female at birth. Those are not fine if the person was labeled male at birth. That is plainly discrimination on the basis of sex, which is barred by the law. Okay, now the three dissenters in the case have some objections. Justice Alito is particularly apoplectic about this holding. So they say, come on, in 1964, the legislators did not intend these sorts of protections. No American would have thought that these sorts of protections had been written into the law. To which the court says, we are textualists, you are textualists. That is not what we look at. We look at the words of the statute. The dissenters say, well, we can prove that this is not sex discrimination. Imagine an employer has a box on an application form that says, are you LGBT? And then refuses to hire anyone who ticks the box. The employer doesn't even know the sex of the people checking the box. Simply 
doesn't hire anyone in that category that does center say that proves it's not sex discrimination men and women are both being not allowed on the basis of their orientation or gender identity and the court says no that's not understanding what's going on you can't explain the employer's objection without adverting to the concept of sex you can't explain in other words homosexuality or what it is to be transgender without referring to the concept of sex and the fact that the employer f doesn't hire men or women makes it doubly problematic not acceptable and finally, the court says, what we're doing isn't so unusual. When Title VII was first passed, it wasn't understood to protect discrimination on the basis of motherhood. It wasn't understood to protect discrimination on the basis of sexual harassment. Those weren't seen as forms of behavior that were discrimination on the basis of sex. Now we all, or now the court agrees that those things are sex discrimination. That is the kind of reading that this is. We've seen this before, uh, and uh, our decision is not unusual or out of keeping with past precedent. Okay, unfortunately, the court doesn't end there. It says, now we've made this holding, but we're deeply concerned about the possible infringements on the rights of religious people. So we're gonna mention three possible exceptions that might operate to uh, excuse religious folks from having to abide by this ruling. The first exception the court talks about is an exception in Title VII itself. Title VII bars discrimination on the basis of religion, but it written into the statute is an exception for religious organizations that want to discriminate on the basis of religion. So if you are a Catholic church and you're hiring a priest or even a, a Catholic school teacher, you can hire, you can prefer a Catholic and discriminate against people of other religions. Okay, that in recent years, and this is gonna be a theme here in the last couple minutes of my talk, in recent years that, has ex that exception has been expanded out to suggest that not only can religious organizations prefer co-religionists, but they can also discriminate against people who are not, quote, uh, conducting themselves according to the norms or uh, tenets of the religion. So there was a case in which a Catholic school teacher was fired because she got remarried, case uh, Catholic school teacher uses birth control, supports abortion, all those cases fired and it's fine because the court says these weren't Catholics in good standing. There's a case of an employee in a Baptist church who quote, took a leadership position in an organization that publicly supported homosexual lifestyles. Again, not the religious exemption protected the employer in that case. So that's one exception that the court notes. But even more worryingly, the court invokes the ministerial exception. The ministerial exception is not part of Title VII. It is a court-created doctrine. The court has interpreted the First Amendment to say that when religious organizations are hiring ministers, they don't have to follow any anti-discrimination law. So not the, the Title VII exemption allows you to discriminate on the basis of religion. The ministerial exception allows you to discriminate on all the bases, race, national origin, sex, disability and age, any anti-discrimination protections. You don't have to follow when you're hiring ministers to avoid excessive government entanglement in the freedom of religion. Now here's what's happened. And it's part of an enormous movement on the part of the religious right to uh, blunt the effect of anti-discrimination law, courts have expanded the concept of minister. Expanded it quite far. When I say minister, you're thinking of minister, priest, rabbi, imam. That's not what it means in the law anymore. It increasingly means workers for religiously affiliated organizations. As you may know, a decision came down this summer uh, involving two fifth grade teachers at a Catholic school. Uh, those teachers filed age and disability discrimination suits, and the court said uh, their employer was not required to follow anti-discrimination law because those teachers were ministers. Now, this is an expansion of the law because those teachers didn't have any particular religious training. They weren't referred to by the title of minister. They spent almost all of their day teaching math and English and science but the court held them to be ministers. So Justice Sotomayor in dissent says, this is extremely worrisome. 
coaches, camp counselors, social service workers, in-house lawyers, media relations personnel, many folks who work for religious organizations could now be counted as ministers. And I will tell you my concern and the kind of maximalist reading of the ministerial exception would extend to healthcare, right? You could imagine a uh, court, and this is certainly the movement arguing, that religiously affiliated hospitals, the folks who work for them, nurses, maybe even doctors, are ministering to the sick, right? This is an, an, a campaign to uh, define an enormous swath of the American workforce as ministers and thus stri strip them of any anti-discrimination protection, certainly the protections enunciated in Bostock, but any protection uh, of Title VII. And the final exemption that the court mentions is RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. This is a 1993 law that states, if you have a law, a neutral law of general applicability that substantially burdens a person's religion, the law must satisfy strict scrutiny. So the government must show it serves a compelling government interest and it's narrowly tailored to that interest. This law was enacted, it was introduced by Schumer and Kennedy. It was enacted as a shield to protect the religious freedom of minority groups who are being injured by laws of general applicability. Imagine Native Americans who wanna use peyote in a particular ceremony, but there's law, anti-drug laws bar peyote. That was the vision of who was protected by this law. But in a spectacular transformation, the law is now being used not as a shield, but as a sword to protect uh, to grant religious individuals license to discriminate against others by exempting them from all the entire anti-discrimination regime. Uh, and courts are increasingly saying there are laws of general applicability, they're substantially burdening religion, and they don't meet this difficult strict scrutiny test. You may have read the Hobby Lobby case where the court said, uh, Hobby Lobby, a corporation, is a person for the purpose of this law, and it is a religious person, and the ACA's contraception mandate uh, violates its exercise of religion, it doesn't have to obey that. Okay. The sorry, the district court in the Harris Funeral Homes case, the Amy Stevens case, held that the funeral home was protected by RIFRA. Uh, if the court continues to interpret RIFRA, to excuse religious organizations from the mandates of anti-discrimination law, this will truly be the monster that eats anti-discrimination law. We will not have much of it left. Okay, that is not a particularly happy note to end on. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, these are real threats to the gains that uh, Bostock represents. But I, I just wanna say that LGBT individuals are now situated in the same category as racial minorities, as women, as older people, as people with disabilities. In other words, people who actually have rights to be defended. And that is more than I could have said two months ago. And I will take it. I will take it. Great. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for some more discussion about um, not only the incredible achievement of this case, uh, but this really campaign to expand these uh, religious liberty exemptions and really um, potentially gut um, anti-discrimination laws, access, health, access to healthcare laws uh, for all sorts of people. But we're gonna go on to our next speaker, um, Andy Mara, who is incredible. Um, Jennifer already introduced her, so I'll just say that Andy has been, uh, I feel like I've never not known Andy, but I'm sure there was a time that I didn't. Um, she has served uh, in so many capacities in the LGBTQ movement and in other movements, um, and Huffington Post named her one of the most compelling LGBTQ people, and I couldn't agree more, so Andy will let you take it from here. <laughs> well, thank you, Brad, and thank you to UCLA Law for hosting this conversation. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Um, I think just to start, I, I just want to ground us in a, in a couple of points, especially in the moment that we're all confronted by. One, um, it's important to remember, um, I think, for, for transgender people across the country that uh, Amy Stevens um, and the Harris Funeral Homes case that was joined we came into the joint ruling of Bostock. Uh, but Amy Stevens and the Harris case was the first ever trans rights case to be heard by SCOTUS. Um, it was the first time 
uh, a transgender person stood before the chief justices and uh, stood in her truth. Um, there were two transgender attorneys in particular, uh, Gabriel Arkles and Chase Strangio at the ACLU, who represented Amy Stevens and frankly all transgender people across the country in front of a conservative leaning uh, Supreme Court. And it's also worth noting that transgender leaders across the country and in, in the movement took part in signing numerous amicus briefs to make the case and to make sure that our voices were well represented. Um, and I think it's also worth noting too, especially on decision day, that uh, LGBTQ plus people won uh, because of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And uh, LGBTQ plus people across the country owe a debt of gratitude to black and brown people who came before us and fought so hard for civil rights protections. Um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Alito's dissent and some of the challenges that uh, trans people face and uh, a couple things to, to guide my remarks. One is that I am an optimistic person and uh, I believe that our movement will win. And two, um, I am approaching this from a movement lens, an activist lens. So while I'm, I'm embedding uh, a legal perspective in my remarks, I'm also um, undoubtedly bringing an activist lens um, to what I'm about to say. So uh, first things first, I think with Alita's dissent, um, what was very striking to my staff and I at the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund was that we were compared to pirates, um, Justice Alito, uh, compared um, the, the litigants that brought the litigation forward to uh, as essentially as pirates and um, specifically, you know, bringing arguments that sailed under a textualist flag um, uh, in making the arguments that Title VII protected LGBTQ plus people. But I think also what was more dis most disturbing about Alito's um, dissent is that it really relied on harmful and already debunked myths about our community. Um, LGBTQ people uh, were essentially compared to being rapists and sexual predators, and we were also being cast as folks that had suffered from severe mental illness. Um, but in, in bringing up the hopeful aspect um, uh, within Alito's dissent for the movement is that essentially Justice Alito laid out a roadmap for advancing legal equality for transgender people, um, and some of that work is already underway. Um, and uh, just, to, just to give you a sense of some of the areas that we're talking about, it's healthcare, uh, you know, in relationship to transgender people being recognized with pronouns, um, sports, um, and, and a number of other categories. So let me, so let me jump on in. So uh, Justice Alito um, made reference of of the fact that, you know, Title VII, or I should say, Neil, Chief Justice Gorsuch has made the reference that the, the judges were focused on addressing whether or not Title VII protects people and whether they should be fired because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. It didn't include anything else. However, there's a number of, lit there's a number of active litigation um, that's being brought that relies on Title VII protections. Um, healthcare is absolutely one of them. Um, TILDAF maintains a trans health project um, and uh, we have um, a growing portfolio of healthcare litigation that relies upon Title VII protections. Um, and so, uh, what I, you know, what was exciting for us at Tildef was that, you know, one of our one of our lawsuits that's active, Cato v. Fowl, uh, was cited in the dissent in Justice Alito's dissent. And uh, you know, we're absolutely a, proud to be a part of the parade of horribles, as I'm sure we could be described as. Um, but, it's important to remember that also that with, with Title VII uh, and the healthcare protections that are afforded under Title VII, uh, because trans people, Supreme Court has made the case that uh, trans people are protected under the category of sex, um, active litigation like Cato v. Fowl, in addition, um, Boston v. HHS that was just filed in the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts has now a strong argument that trans people are protected um, and should have access to health care. And it's um, specific to the, the, the last piece of litigation that I just mentioned um, that was just filed on July 9th um, against Health and Human Service in regards to the recent rules that were, that were brought um, 
to essentially remove um, specific non-discrimination provisions from Section 1557. Um, the fact of the matter is that there are still statutory protections that still exist and include trans people and we are still protected under the law. Um, our litigation um, is using um, claims uh, around that the, the administration has violated the Administrative Protection Act um, and that uh, the, the rules that were brought about under the Obama administration um, should remain intact um, because of the, of the essentially the procedures that were used to um, to move forward the change in rules. Um, so I think for, for trans folks across the country, the main message is that the main message should be is that transgender healthcare um, is still protected. Um, and Title VII, because of this ruling, uh, means that we have a we have a strong case to argue future litigation. This is a strong this is a window of opportunity for us. Um, in terms of uh, pronouns and, and First Amendment, the First Amendment, you know, there was a separate section in Alito's dissent that um, covered freedom of speech um, and raising the concerns around uh, essentially uh, people being forced to use gender pronouns against their will. And uh, you know, there there is some I think examples of this sentiment in, in the courts, to be frank. Um, judge Kyle Duncan, who is an appellate judge in the Fifth Circuit, um, he authored an opinion um, after a trans woman uh, filed a motion uh, simply to be recognized with her with her preferred pronouns. Um, it was a non-binding opinion, but Judge Duncan uh, essentially laid out a really cruel argument that asserted that transgender should, people should not be recognized as our authentic selves in the courtrooms. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a second and how Title VII could, could apply. Um, sex segregated facilities and sports, you know, uh, there's active litigation right now in Connecticut that challenges uh, whether or not transgender people should be allowed to play in, in sports that match their gender identity. Um, fortunately, Title IX includes sex um, and with, uh, in, in using the argument uh, of sex, including uh, transgender people, um, uh, there's, an, there's a strong argument um, that this act of litigation uh, that that is current that is currently being brought in Connecticut uh, will side on the on, uh, will be on the right side of history for transgender people, particularly young transgender people who are playing sports who are trying to simply access facilities at their schools um, uh, that match who they are. So, well, you know, Bostock technically only answered the specific question of whether it was illegal to fire someone because of their gender identity or because they're transgender. You know, the reasoning of Bostock that discrimination against trans people um, is sex discrimination. And it essentially applies to all situations where anti-discrimination um, may arise. And for TILDEF, you know, we intend to rely on the Bostock ruling now um, because we have a really incredible window to argue that requiring someone to use the wrong bathroom because they're transgender, excluding them from access to transgender-related healthcare, misgendering them, whether it's on personnel files or with uniform requirements and so on, is, is simply illegal. Now, uh, there was I saw that there was a question that popped up um, in, in, the, in the chat box around the military. And while you know, matters in the military are not a part of our litigation portfolio, um, you know, it's worth noting that there are more than 14,000 trans service members um, and, uh, you know, the, the recent ruling um, is believed to not necessarily affect the military uh, because courts have held uh, that Title VII does not pertain. Um, and, you know, what's worrying for me is that the military is the nation's largest employer for trans folks. And I, I think that it'll be very interesting to see how that particular uh, issue moves forward. Um, Finally, I just want to add, um, in, in bringing the movement lens um, to the forefront, um, there are some limits to Bostock as it pertains to the lived experiences of trans people across the country. Um, one, for the attorneys, the law students, um, and those that especially engage in public interest law or pro bono work um, as, it, as it pertains to trans people, there is an exceptional need for public education around uh, Title VII and how this applies to transgender people. Um, TILDEF recently um, conducted a series of surveys with um, grassroots community-based organ transgender organizations, mostly that serve black and brown transgender people. And um, there, is, there is a belief that title, uh, this recent ruling um, and Title VII really doesn't impact their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I think it reflects 
um, the fundamental struggle for transgender people to even attain employment or even have access to economic opportunity, let alone be fired from a job. And um, as one activist said to, um, to us, you know, folks think it's not for me because I work at Taco Bell. Um, so I, I, I just want to make sure that we lift up that there is, a, there, even though this was an incredible win uh, for trans people across the country, and there is now an, there is an exciting window to move forward on, in a number of areas, uh, there is also the need for us to continue to educate our community um, and to raise awareness about the substantial impact of this ruling um, and how uh, it applies to um, not just trans people, but LGBT, LGBTQ people writ large. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the three opinions in Bostock, you can see how much work uh, we all have to do um, around transgender rights. Um, uh, Alito points out the challenges that Andy mentions. Um, Gorsuch reaches a good result, but can't get the language or an understanding of trans people right. And Kavanaugh, perhaps uh, the worst of all, um, doesn't even mention the word transgender or gender identity anywhere uh, in his opinion, even though he praises gay and lesbian advocates at the end of that opinion, he does not mention bisexual or transgender people. So whether it's opposition, confusion, or erasure, I think uh, we all might have had our own experiences or know people that need help um, to be brought uh, into more understanding and acceptance of trans people. And as allies, I think we can all do that. Um, and Annie does incredible work. If you're not connected with her on social media or giving to her organization, um, these results don't happen without work like Andy and her organization. Um, they also don't happen without the work of uh, people like Afonso David and HRC. Um, and I know many of us have had various opinions about H HRC over the last 40 years, and I can tell you it's a new day, it's a new dawn. Uh, if you haven't checked in recently, you need to check in now. Um, I was so uh, pleasantly um, surprised to see Alfonso talking with my friend Ashley Marie Preston uh, in the last couple of weeks about voting rights, and I was thinking about how great as they were would any former ED of HRC take the time um, uh, to have that conversation uh, or even the courage to have that conversation with an act activist like Ashley Marie Preston. Uh, and Alfonso, I'm just blown away by what you've been able to accomplish there already um, and excited to hear you speak. Well, Brad, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all the work that you and your team and the rest of the folks do at UCLA. Uh, the research that you folks put out has been so instrumental to the movement over the past several decades. I know I've been doing this work for more than 20 years and I've been relying on the research from the Williams Institute, so thank you for that. Um, I think a lot has been said about uh, the Bostock decision and what it means for all of us. Uh, yes, is a significant decision, but it has significant limitations as well. And I don't want to tread over a lot of the issues that have already been addressed, but I think there are a few that are worth highlighting. Uh, for me, when I read the decision, it reminded me in a way of on call. Many people know about the on call decision. It was a case involving a lawsuit by a male oil rig worker who claimed that he was repeatedly subjected to sexual harassment by male co workers. And this decision was penned by Scalia. And Scalia, in the majority opinion, he effectively said that workplace discrimination includes uh, sexual harassment by male co workers. Um, it was a great ruling, but we were also concerned about the application. And we were concerned about the holding in Ancal being limited or limiting same-sex harassment to three situations that were enumerated in the holding. We also were concerned about the difficulties of proving an aggressor's sexual desire or orientation because of the inference that is not really presumed and how are plaintiffs going to have to prove that someone was actually harassing them when the person, when, when sexual orientation may not be presumed in those cases. Now, we've seen court decisions over the past few years. Many of them are inconsistent about the application of on call, whether or not it's a broad application or a limited application. And so when I read the Bostock decision, I had the same reaction. That here we have a significant ruling 
that says that LGBTQ people should be treated the same as everyone else under Title VII because of sex includes sexual orientation and, and gender identity, which is great. But we know about the limitations. The court said it doesn't, re it doesn't relate to religious uh, objections. They're not talking about that issue. They're certainly not talking about sex segregated spaces. Um, so we're talking about bathrooms. So we're also talking about sports. Uh, those issues the court did not address at all in Bostock. And I'm not suggesting that we would lose those cases if they were to be advanced to the Supreme Court, but it does open up the possibility that we will be confronted with those cases in the near future where opponents of equality will use Bostock against us. So I'm concerned about that. I also think that it's important for us to think about the implications of Bostock on people of color. Um, when we talk about the LGBTQ community, often the faces that you see are not people of color. And that has unfortunately been our history, but that has to change. And as we're thinking about Bostock, we also have to think about how it applies specifically to places of public accommodations, because it doesn't. Um, Bostock broadly applied, if you were to say Bostock can be interpreted to mean that because of sex, as referenced in every single federal statute, should mean that you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender identity. I think that's a fair interpretation. But we have places of public accommodations that are not included in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So restaurants and hotels are certainly included, but there are other places, retail stores, salons, transportation hubs are not included. And that is of significant concern for me. So people of color continue to face persistent discrimination on a daily basis in stores, in salons, in accessing transportation services, like car services and, and taxis. For example, recently in, George, in a Georgetown neighborhood in Washington, DC, uh, clerks utilize a mobile app uh, that allow them to profile suspected shoplifters. When, when they reviewed the, the data, 90% of the photographs that they took were of black people, often accompanied by racist language. In Wisconsin, a black professional basketball player was denied access to a jewelry store based on his race. Um, this is happening all over the country. Now, in each of these instances, the individuals had recourse under state law but they would have been unable to address that issue if they lived in Virginia or if they lived in Mississippi or somewhere else in the country. So the, the Bostock decision certainly, I think, broadly applies, says that you can't discriminate against LGBTQ people where federal law says you can't discriminate on the basis of sex or because of sex. We can certainly make that argument and I think it's a credible one. But there are no federal laws that protect us when I get into an Uber or a Lyft as a black man or as a gay man. There are no federal laws that protect me in the instance of a retail establishment. If I want to go in and purchase a suit or you know, a, a t-shirt, uh, I can face discrimination under federal law uh, because there's no federal law, I should say. I can face discrimination unless I have recourse under state law. So Bostock is incredibly important for us, is a huge landmark achievement, but we cannot lose sight of how much work we have to do. The Equality Act is a piece of legislation that the Human Rights Campaign has been advocating for for a very long time now. It has passed the House of Representatives, but is stalled in the, state, in the, in, 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 in the US Senate. And that piece of legislation would provide comprehensive protections for LGBTQ people that currently does not exist. And we will be making those arguments as to how Bostock applies in other contexts, such as the Affordable Care Act, right? As you know, the Trump administration recently issued a set of regulations where they said that the, the Affordable Care Act, the provision that says you can't discriminate on the basis of sex, the Trump administration is now saying that provision does not protect LGBTQ people, when in fact, HHS has previously said that it does. And that ruling came out, regulation came out after Bostock. So the Human Rights Campaign and Lambda Legal and a variety of other organizations are suing the Trump administration for that interpretation. So yes, celebrate Bostock for what it is, but we have so much, so much work.
to do to make sure that LGBTQ people are treated with equality? Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Alfonso. Um, uh, so we just have a few minutes for questions, but one of the questions uh, that, that um, came back in is kind of this balance between um, laws that prohibit discrimination and religious liberty. And Carrie, maybe we could go back to you and to talk about, um, you know, these are both important values in our society. Um, how, should we, how should we talk about these issues and how should we balance them? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's really important is um, for the folks defending uh, rights for LGBTQ plus individuals uh, not to be pigeonholed in the frame that the right is trying to put upon us, which is that we're anti-religion, that we're against religion. Like, we're fighting for LGBT and that is against religious rights, right? That is just not the right conceptualization of what is going on. First of all, many LGBTQ plus people are deeply religious. There's a lot of intersectionality in these communities. And so it's wrong to uh, portray religious people as, as monolithic. Uh, and uh, LGBTQ people as trying to suppress their rights. I think the frame needs to be one of neutrality. We've, we've had law in the past that was truly interested in neutrality uh, toward religion. And <clears throat> one of the reasons that we had Democratic Congress people pushing for RIFRA is that they were worried about religious discrimination. This was the left that was trying to protect religious people and has a long tradition of trying to protect religious people and churches. And we should own that and be proud of it and say that if there are minority religions whose practices are being suppressed inadvertently or advertently by the majority, that needs to be stopped. And there should be anti-discrimination law to protect those people. One of the facets of Title VII one of the aspects of Title VII that is protected is religious discrimination. There are coalitions. We should be working for just protecting people of color, protecting women, protecting religious folks who face discrimination. What the argument is against is using quote unquote protections for religions as actually a tool to allow people to suppress others. Right? That was never what the religious protections were attempting to do, to say you just get a, a, a complete freedom to twist protection, religious protections in order you know, to be a tool to suppress others. And in fact, let me just end by saying, this is not a new fight. When Title VII was first passed, a lot of employers said, I can't hire black people because it's contrary to my religion for black people and white people to mingle in restaurants. And the court said, no, that is not what our religious protections in this country do. They don't give you a license to um, create third party harms and discriminate against others. And we have a long tradition of it working that way. I think we need to talk about the, um, the changes that are happening as what they really are, a radical revolution to use religion as a tool of suppression. And that is not what the constitution intended. Great, thank you. We have a number of questions coming in and only a couple of minutes left. So uh, we're gonna go two or three minutes over, but I wanna respect everyone's time. Um, Andy, um, a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, people wanna know how to support your organization, so put that in the chat. They wanna know how do we lift up um, kind of leadership of trans people and people of color? How do we kind of support um, new leadership and people um, at this time? Um, and if you have any predictions about the sports cases. So you can think about those. Uh, that was a compound question. Um, and while you're thinking about those, Alfonso, I'll give you some th things to think about and you can talk about that as well. Um, there's some disbelief that the Civil Rights Act um, prompted by sit-ins at lunch counters and other places kind of left out public accommodation. So uh, if you could address uh, that gap. Um, and talk about the role of state law. Some states already have good laws. Uh, what does this all, what does Bostock and the Quality Act mean for them? Um, do we still need to do that work in the states uh, that, don't, um, that don't already include sexual orientation or gender identity? Or as you know, in some parts of the country, just don't have good state laws on any basis already. So you think about that and we'll go back to Andy about uplifting kind of trans leadership, uh, your organizations and a prediction on the sports cases. Well, let me just quickly, since we don't have too much time, I, 
I want to prioritize the question around um, leadership of trans folks, especially as it regards to legal strategies. And I think, you know, for Tilda, there is no monopoly on this, and there should be no monopoly on this. And I know that a number of legal advocacy organizations in our movement are are increasingly taking this approach, but we need to center trans people um, in all of the work that we do and in all of the strategies that we that, that we pursue. Uh, you know, I'll be very clear. You know, one exercise that Tildeck is going through right now is is and is continuing to go through is how do we um, hold uh, the activist lens, the lived experience lens, uh, with regards to uh, you know. The, the numerous issues that, that, that are being challenged on a day-to-day -day basis by the current administration um, and do it in a way that is accessible for our movement. Um, I think it's no secret that, uh, that in terms of, uh, of the field of law and policy, there, there, it, is, it still remains a niche um, for trans and non-binary people across the country to have access to these tables. And I would say that for for organizations that are that are that are working on everything from uh, legal services to policy, whether it's at the local, state, or federal levels, absolutely make sure that there is a racial and gender equity lens um, to the programmatic work that you pursue, um, as well as thinking about how you operationalize that across your organizations. Um, I would say, you know, a good example of, of a place to invest in and support. Um, specifically as it pertains to trans people in fields of law and policy would be the National Transgender Bar Association, um, dedicated to uh, increasing the pool of trans attorneys. And I think that precisely for the work that they do and the issues that they represent, um, they're seeking to build the pipeline or build the bench um, to ensure that there is authentic leadership at the table um, that can accurately represent the needs of our community, and I and I go back to what I said about um, the SCOTUS the SCOTUS um, ruling, and the fact that there were two trans people that were that were at the Supreme Court that represented Amy Stevens. It was a monumental moment uh, for our movement and a monumental moment for our community to see that kind of leadership demonstrated um, in our nation's highest court. Thanks, Andy and Alfonso. Do you want to bring us home with kind of final thoughts on where to move from here? Sure, sure. And I, before I answer the question, I just want to say uh, Andy is an amazing, amazing leader and an amazing lawyer. Um, so with respect to the question on public accommodation and state law, you, uh, correct. The 1964 Civil Rights Act does include places of public accommodation like restaurants and hotels, but it does not expressly include important providers of goods and services like retail stores, accountants, and salons. And so there is a concern, and we've seen this in places in, throughout the country, where people argue that the Civil Rights Act does not extend to other places where goods and services are being provided. In addition, transportation hubs, such as the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world, are not included in the Civil Rights Act, and so we need to make sure that they are actually included. I should know because I drafted legislation in New York to make sure that those, those hubs were indeed going to be covered. New York has the oldest human rights law in the country, 1945. Many other states don't have state laws that actually protect LGBTQ people. So to the point of making sure that LGBTQ people are protected, I'll leave you with a sobering thought. In 29 states in this country, there are no comprehensive protections for LGBTQ people. So what that means is, if there is no federal protection, there is no Equality Act, an LGBTQ person would have no protections under state law, and as a result, would be subject to discrimination. So we do need legislation to make sure that we're protected. We are going to aggressively interpret Bostock consistent with the spirit of the ruling, but we need to make sure that LGBTQ people are unequivocally protected in all facets of life. Great, thank you, Afonso. I wanna thank all of you for bearing with us for a few extra minutes. I think you'll agree with me, uh, it, it, it was very much well worth it. Uh, and thanks to our excellent panel, um, we're gonna provide you contact information, uh, donation information, uh, and answer your questions in a follow-up email, but thank you. <laughs>